Hello, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Dave and Ed podcast. Our guest today is a music legend from Ireland, from Cork, to be specific, yeah. doing an American accent and everything. It's the great Gerdy O'Leary. Ladies and gentlemen, Gerdy O'Leary. Ireland is not part of the UK. That's correct. Yes. No way. Are you serious? <laughs> so, Gerdy, welcome to the show, man. Thanks for coming Thank on. You Thanks, Gerdy. Thank you. Thank, it's David, right? Dave, yeah. Dave yeah, O'Hara. Yeah, O'Hara from, yeah, from Limerick. From Limerick originally. Oh, from Limerick. Um, yes, oh, yeah. yeah. Um, Fair play. So, go on, Dave. Um, so, Gerdy, how are things in uh, Deutschland? Yeah, how are you? <laughs> Very good. Yeah? Good, uh, it's okay, yeah. Uh, not so bad. If you're referring to the COVID business, it's, it hasn't been so bad. Rand, so you haven't been affected by that at all? Like, No, not straight up. Actually, but actually my, my partners had a friend in Ireland who, whose husband died. Oh, right. Okay. So right. in that sense, I have encountered it, but I haven't met anybody here who's got it. Nice one. Right. Nice one. And, and if uh, you talk about p- police corruption and violence, it's not so bad. Good, 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 good. Glad Brilliant. to hear that. How's your German? It's okay. I, um, I can, uh, I can have basic conversations. Right, right. Well, so, um, we'll talk. We'll talk more about life in Germany later on. But let's go way back in time to Cork. Right, okay. Cork yeah, okay. in the early sixties or mid sixties. Yeah, you grew up in the in an oven. You were born in an oven. Born in an oven. <laughs> Was that it? <laughs> <laughs> it's even worse than that. It's even worse. Let me explain, right? <laughs> okay. Please do. This ovens business, Ray, is a corruption of wait for it. Oav is a cave. Right, right. So Nohuevena are the caves. So I grew up in a cave. <laughs> people people there couldn't handle the idea of telling other people, well, I'm from a cave. So they right. changed it into ovens, which they thought was a very cute idea at the time. But they discovered later on that I'd have to actually answer these questions later on in life, just to explain. Actually, it's even worse than that. It was a cave. But it's yeah. true. O- o- Oiv is a cave, and the uh, ovens is a corruption of Nahuavan. Yeah, when I was when I was uh, you know growing up in Limerick, and we hear of about ovens. Um, we like I thought it was an industrial estate or something. Yeah, 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 yeah. It didn't but sound like a place at all. Yeah, it's true, and it probably isn't. It's less of a place now than it was when I was a kid. But why would you hear about ovens in Limerick? Um, there was a lad. Um, um, I was drawing silage one summer, and there was a fella drawing silage with me from ovens. No way. Yeah. Wow. And what? What part He's a big fat, you, big oh. fat guy. Um, All right, okay. Newcastle West. He was a big fat cunt from ovens. <laughs> All right. So Newcastle West, I, yeah. I bought a banjo there. Did you really? <laughs> yeah. Dead true. And as far as I know as well, Michael Hartnett, the poet, was from there. That's correct. Yeah, right. So yeah. I, I, I find it. And there's a, a, a festival in his honor every year. There is. That's right. And, so and I found it quite a nice little place. Uh, it's grand, yeah. It's uh, uh, Ballygown Spring Water as well. It's, no way, really. Yeah, it's from Newcastle West. Brilliant. What, Gertie, were, were you like born? Uh, this is kind of a question for uh, that our American viewers will be fascinated to know more about, I think. Like, yeah. were you born speaking Irish? Like, was Irish your first language uh, as it should be? <laughs> <laughs> Not exactly, but my my grandmother was was uh, she hailed from uh, Gurti Rahala in Kule, right? And right. she used to li- live with us every day. Now Kule is west of Mukroom in the in the Muskerry Gaeltacht area, and um, it's not so far from where Sean O'Reilly lived for a good right. while. He wasn't there at the time, of course, and she moved later on then to Karaginima, where Arthur Lera was killed. And then uh, married a man from Mill Street and moved down when that land was being given out. Uh, right. and are you still there, boy? We, we are, yeah, we're oh, listening yeah, attentively. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, she was in and out of the house every day. So at one stage, I thought she had some connection with Israel. Wow. And you, you, you might find it strange, but in 1967, there was a war going on. Uh, this, I think they called it the Seven Days War, and Moshe yeah. Diane 
was yeah. the general of the Israeli army. And my grandmother used to say Musha all the time. Oh, Wisha, Musha, because Musha is the Irish for indeed. So right. I said, well, she must have a connection with this guy, Musha Diane. They must be connected. <laughs> Well, you know, when you're seven or something yeah. like that, and, you're, <laughs> and your mother is going, oh, your grandmother is going, oh, mushum creature in book. And you're going, musha, oh, yeah. And then you hear about musha Diane on the radio, you think, oh, yeah, so Israel must be out, it must be out there near Balavorna or a little bit west of Mushra or right. somewhere out there, because that's, they were always talking about Balavorna and stuff. So when you were seven, did you think you were a Jew? <laughs> I didn't even think of those terms, like uh, religion or anything like that. But it, I was definitely uh, uh, felt that uh, uh, my grandmother was somehow connected with this war that was seven day war or something. Oh. Or when she yeah. left the house every every day to head back to her own place, which was next nearby, she was on the phone to Moshe Diane giving him instructions on <laughs> how to deal with the Egyptian <laughs> army or something. But. Uh, really? It was just like you're a child and you're hearing Musha Diane on the radio and you hear your grandmother kind of going, oh, Musha. <laughs> <laughs> They're obviously connected with each other. Absolutely. And, and like, the, how was the feelings in the family regarding English people? Was there like that standard Irish hatred? Or no, no, no. Although my grandmother had been, uh, the black and tans had attempted to rape her uh, uh, when she was young in, M in Mill Street. Oh. Uh, she might have been a, a young, good-looking thingy and, uh, in the earlier part of the 20th century, but um, that was never really brought up. You say, you, not, not, to, not to get into the gory details, but you say attempted, so she fought them off like? Somehow she... escaped, anyway, but they, they, they roughed her up fairly badly, so she had not much time for them. And of course. My mother's father's father was this guy Sean Ribardo Sullivan who was put to put into jail for crimes against the British crown for organizing um, during the land league times right wow and he he had been hiding in in, in uh, Tipperary for a while and he was also known as as the Baird because his his name was Robert Sean Robert and he did about something like 16 years in Cork jail. Wow. So that was situated, that place, that part, that part, of that jail was situated where UCC is now. So he's kind of a fairly learned fella, I'd say, by the time he got out of there. But uh, I think he got out in time to wave the Brits goodbye when they were leaving yeah. the room or something like that. But it wasn't mentioned so much as a, as a thing, you know. Although, although in school, I, I, I I remember reading and learning all about Pardew Pierce and everything. And it struck yeah. me one day, I said, my God, they could come back because the Irish population was about two and a half million. And suddenly I got a big fright one day when I was about nine years of age, when I suddenly realized hey, the English could actually easily come back if they felt like, and this whole business could start again. Yeah, yeah. But the uh, Brit hating wasn't really part of the, the psychology. I guess, I mean, nobody, nobody really hates English people, rather it's the British establishment that you have to be wary of. I mean, sure. it's usually the establishment that's trying to fuck the ordinary people uh, as well. But it's something that you, everybody knows. Yes, yeah, for sure, for sure. And, and, and how, how was Cork, like how was growing up in Cork back in the day, 60s? Slash well, I didn't. I didn't go into the city at all when I was a kid. I didn't like it. Okay. Um, at all, um, because the ovens at the time was very rural, and running in the fields was much more enjoyable. I right. didn't like the city. It was a bit frightening for me. But uh -huh. when I became a teenager, it was like a different story. And Cork in the seventies was a quite an odd place. It really was, you know. Right. Because when I met you first, uh, Ed, you, you did that great one-man show that you did. Indeed. And that reminded me much of the Cork personality. And lately, when I was telling my partner here that, oh, yeah, uh, Ed Malone has contacted me. She didn't remember you at first. And then I reminded her of you. And I said, he did this one-man show. 
and you you really liked it. It was very eccentric, and he was working in Roche's stores, and he was living with his mother, and he had problems with alcohol and sexuality <laughs> and stuff. And she said, "Oh, that was brilliant." And I said, "Yeah, that was the way Cork was when I when I was a kid, full of interesting characters." By the time we got back to Cork in the two thousands, when I met you, the place was a bit more kind of middle class and sort of yeah. It wasn't as, as crazy as it was in the seventies. Right. So. so Tell us more about makes, the craziness of the seventies. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. There's a lot more characters around, so you could, you have these. You had like, there was an American I knew called Roger Gregg who was amazed by the amount of fellas that would come up to him, and they had strong like North Side accents or out rap peak, and they'd yeah. be going, oh, you're, "You're from the states, yeah, yeah. Do you <laughs> like that? Do you like Captain Beef <laughs> I love that fucking album, you know, Trout Mass Replica is amazing. You know what I mean? <laughs> and he's going to go, Jesus, these weird guys who like all these odd fucking uh, <laughs> unexpected things. And there was also uh, a lot of the working class people in Cork used to like opera and stuff like that. Right. They'd sing along with stuff that they weren't sure what it meant. <laughs> you know, like uh, it was an odd kind of a place where you would find. It wasn't streamlined. Remember in the 2000s, you could kind of swap some groovy, middle-class, intellectual kind of a fella. Yeah. And swap him with some fella from Berlin, and you'd hardly notice the difference. Sure. Yeah. You know, there was this kind of like, everybody was suddenly into uh, fucking uh, new music, uh, right. experimental this and that. And, and they were kind of boring at the same time compared to the mad fuckers that used to be around in the 70s. Now, I don't want to paint everybody in the 70s to have wonderful lives or anything. A lot of times, there was a lot of poverty and yeah. kind of sad stories behind it. But there was an awful lot of eccentric odd fellas on the street that would come up to you and start talking about the maddest shit. <laughs> yeah. and, and, and do you... Do you think like it, it got a little bit, bit more boring because there was more money around or? or? Yeah, it, it, yeah, it gets a bit more kind of globalized and yeah. like it, yeah. it becomes more like a monoculture. You know, like as Ireland moved through the 20th century, it becomes more of a monoculture than less. Hmm. And even though people thought, oh, there's Polish people around now and there's black people moving in and all these different uh, interesting uh, ethnic groups. Um, and but the actual basis of Irish culture becomes more of a monoculture as it gets more sort of money than people all have the same cars with the same mobile phones. And, yeah, mm -hmm. do you know that's kind of whereas whereas back in the in the seventies you could go to the Iron Islands and you'd meet people who never spoke one word of English. Right. Yeah. And sometimes I think they tried to make documentaries from Inishman and the people didn't want them to come out to the island at all. There was no electricity on, on Inishman in the 70s. So you could have somebody in Dublin talking about Led Zeppelin. So at first, you know, like I just bought the new Led Zeppelin album. And out in Inishman, they wouldn't even know what the fuck you were talking about. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah. You said Led Zeppelin. You know, so, so it was, and then you would horsey people in the Midlands and, and all these different weird combinations, which yeah. needed a sort of a patchwork. But by the 2000s, you had this feeling that it was kind of, everybody was interchangeable or something and it, it it didn't have that eccentric touch that it used to have uh, at a certain point that's right. the impression i got anyway yeah you know those old mad fellas flying around on hot on the 50s I, yes <laughs> yeah. yeah back in, when you were a kid or something yeah. and yeah. those kind of guys were suddenly gone <laughs> and they were, they were replaced by all this the same fella with the same car everywhere you know yes Bre breakfast roll man or something <laughs> Uh, yeah. Tommy Tiernan called them. Right. right. Or the lads. No, no. Or or the fellas driving around on their Massey Ferguson's as well. They're kind of gone as well. The old yeah, yeah, yeah. Like mm. I remember a fella like in in the in in, in Dublin, and he made he he made a lot of hats and T-shirts for festivals. He was a scammer, and somehow anyway he was caught, and he had a whole lot of Iron Maiden T-shirts. <laughs> For, for rock festivals, and he had no nothing to do with him, so he went off to Balnaslo Horse Fair. This is like the eighties, I'd say, and he he sold a langer load of them to all these fellas, and there was all these old guys going around with like 
Death, Death Leopard. And, and what he told them, what he told them was, when they asked him, "What the hell is an Iron Maiden?" He said, it, it, "It's a, it's a, it's a lump hammer from Poland." And they were fucking hell, that's great. <laughs> you know? and it was all this. And I, you're out in the Iron Islands, I remember seeing fellas with Death Leopard t-shirts and old fellas, like, and they probably thought they were ham, ham, combine harvesters, you know, this kind of yeah. mad, weird mixture of fellas, because there was no internet and nobody would, could check anything. So you could tell someone like that, that uh, Iron Maiden was a, was a, 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 a tractor from Czechoslovakia and they oh, yeah. say, oh, great, it's a, fuck, it's a tractor, lad. Great. <laughs> I'll have one for my brother, Tomas, and for for my cousin Martin, <laughs> you know, that, that kind of thing. Like, so it was, it, it was a much fucking odder place Ireland was in the 70s and 80s. Yeah, yeah. And it, be, it quickly became normalized. I mean, that was my uh, feelings about it. Yeah, oh, what, what was your earliest uh, music memory? Like, what, when did you fucking like decide, oh, I'm into music? When, well, I remember being taken to the Flanua because my parents were into traditional music. Right. And the Flanua was going on in Ennis in 74, and I was wandering around the place. And I came across a magazine, a pop magazine, I suppose, or a music magazine. And it had David Bowie on the cover. And in the middle, it had an article about this black guitar player called Jimi Hendrix. And I was going, fuck, look at this guy. <laughs> And I remember that as standing out to me as being, I wanted to get a banjo, and then suddenly I wanted to get a guitar when I saw Hendrix, you know? Mm. And uh, that was about 74. So yeah, music was hitting hard in, in the, uh, in the uh, when I was a teenager, I guess. Yeah. Before that, uh, before I liked Ameri the American Indian, Native American singing, I love that, and African drumming, and Arabic, sounding music i remember liking that but in 1969 or something i remember my mother told me that the beatles had broken up and i didn't know what she was talking about well, right. maybe it was 1970 so uh, i i knew nothing about rock and roll when it was happening right and then and like when when did you start getting into bands of course a lot of the stuff you did in the 70s and 80s vital oh, yeah. vital music like well, it's really odd because a lot of people get to join uh, their or when they're getting into their first bands. They usually kind of say, oh, I was in a local band with this slang ball and blah, blah, blah. And, um, and they can talk about their first five bands being like, ah, we were just trying out. But I actually <laughs> happened to wander in, end up playing with none attacks. Right. I still have a reputation as, and then Michael Disney, which still has a reputation. So then I have, I have spent the next um, 30 years ex until last week or something, two weeks ago, talking about telling, I mean, I'm not, I don't want to talk about it, but people might occasionally contact me and say, oh, what was it like working with Don Lee? And right. it was only about two weeks ago that Don O'Manny from the Examiner uh, uh, contacted me to yeah. interview me about something that I had done <laughs> in the 90s. <laughs> right. So, like I had to move forward because usually I end up talking about like 1979 or 1980 because some fellow might go might ask me about that so it's a bit of an odd situation but Don actually wanted to know what things what happened in 1983 and 1985 and it's like fuck nobody's asked me these questions uh, ever I'd say well we, we'd love to know the intricate details of all those years we would so. yeah <laughs> which year do you want to talk about What's that? Uh, just what? What? <laughs> what year specifically? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, please don't say 1979. Okay, we'll pick a random year. <laughs> yeah, yeah. uh, well, just just give us an outline of the the Cork music scene. Uh, you yeah. know, between 79 and 85. Yes, a rough out. And and, and oh, I, can you wedge in you two in there as well? If oh you, yeah, well, you're, we want to know yeah. your views on you two. Like. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Is Bono really a langer? Like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, are you ready? Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was one of the that was one of the uh, interviews 
where, where things get really mad because somebody contacted me and said, we'll actually pay for you to come over to Ireland to be interviewed about 1979. So sometimes it's a fella like who sends me an email. But this, right. this, was, this program went out, there was an RT program called U2 August on R. That's and correct, yeah. Said, oh yeah, and, that, and they actually brought me over to Ballin College, which, and that's where they interview, interviewed me, and they paid for me to go over there, which is completely mad. Like, so the, the nostalgia industry like, reached yes. the pinnacle at that point. Yeah. And I couldn't believe that I, I was being brought over for that purpose. I said it was grand. It was an opportunity to meet up with the with my mother and my family and stuff. And uh, the interview went on for about three hours. But in the end, they only used a tiny bit of it. But they told me, and the the production company were were very uh, were, were a pretty nice bunch. But they, I think, they wanted to do a bigger program about the art. But RT wanted to do a program about you too. Yeah. See, so, so the the program is very schizophrenic, and so if you if you didn't know anything about Cork and the arc and stuff like that, you wouldn't learn much from the program, I'd say, because right. it looked like the story of the arc was only shoved in there. Right. A little. Uh, that was my impression of it. Anyway, well, there was. Yeah, they they really pushed that show. Like ad, they really advertised it a lot because. Um, you know, I have the RTE player on my computer and oh, right, okay. they ran that commercial for U2 August and Arc for about, I'd say, a year and a half. Yeah, yeah. They really pushed it. So. For a year and a half? Yeah, it kept, it was U, uh, U2 August and Arc, U2 August and Arc. <laughs> Every time I turn on my computer, U2 August and Arc. <laughs> yeah. And then it was Bono, like, you know, like, feeling himself up on the stage, like, you know. Like with with a halo around his head, gorgeous man. It was, it was, it was kind of mad. it was kind of mad. It was um it was a it was a it was a it was a mad era. But the actual story would have been better told if if it was if it was done for TG Cahar. Yeah. And the emphasis wouldn't have been so much on uh, having to have at least fifteen minutes on on you two alone. Right. They might have had a chance to give the whole thing some context as to how you two were playing there and who they were playing with. So um, yeah. the first time I saw them, for instance, they were supporting XTC. All right. Which didn't were they, were they making plans for Nigel? <laughs> yeah, and this, this is just before the, um, the, the era of making plans for Nigel. You're right. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> That's the only XTC but, song I know. That's so. not true. All right, okay. Well, I have to, sorry. The, sorry. The, I have to say that show was probably the most important show that happened in Cork at that stage, the XTC show, because they came out and they did this the most amazing performance that blew everybody away because at the time, punk rock and new wave, were, punk rock wasn't considered to be much other than a sort of a trend. Yeah. And XTC were coming out of punk rock, but they could play and they had these amazing songs. And they put on an amazing, amazing, exciting show. And everybody, there was a whole like kind of going, wow, they're amazing. It's a whole new musical style that blew everybody away. It was about 78 and you too supported them. Oh. And they weren't up to anything much at all at that stage. The yeah. Edge was just playing straight electric guitar into his amplifier, and the whole thing was fairly dull. And um, I didn't think much of them in any sense. Uh, they're just grand, I suppose. But when XTC, who I knew not of, came on stage, I mean, the whole place just blew up. They did an amazing show. And after XTC, everybody wanted to form a band. <laughs> right. They convinced everybody. Uh, and I think all of Non Attacks were there. Wow. And everybody was going, what the fuck? That's amazing. You know, this whole idea that you could do something really fucking mad and brilliant with this new musical form was a, was a so they were very innovative, actually, XTC. Um, and so that, that was, so I, I spoke about that in the interview, how, how um, I mean, U2's rise was phenomenal in that, in that period of time, but they, they started off as a very weak, fairly bland 
sounding kind of affair, and Bono was very annoying as a as a front man. But yeah. I, I didn't have to take much notice of them because I guess nobody knew who they were at that stage. And then a year later, I think we supported them then with with uh, with none attack. And and they had grown considerably uh, in terms of their stage act and all that kind of stuff. And then the following year, supported them with Michael Disney, and you two had at that stage become massive local heroes. Mm -hmm. And also, there's another thing about Cork at the time as well is it had a big uh, university scene, so there was loads of young people there who were kind of wouldn't have gone to the ark at all but went to the ark to see you too because they were hearing it on the radio and they were more like country kids who were coming in from limerick and kerry and tipperary and stuff and they wouldn't have been going down necessarily to see uh, the more experimental bands so suddenly the place was full of young guys that i'd never seen in my life before and didn't see them afterwards ever again you know that kind of thing yeah yeah what was it like gigging in Cork back then, like as a young uh, musician, uh, a young virile musician? <laughs> <laughs> With a big boot on on him. Exactly. Um, um, was there lots of sex, drugs and rock and roll? Yeah, there was uh, no sex. Okay. Pondies were the only drugs. There were, there were sleeping tablets, or no, there were weight, uh, weight loss tablets that people started taking as speed tablets. So everybody st started taking Pondies. <laughs> and sometimes the hippies from West Cork would come in with their cannabis right. and, uh, and very dodgy rock and roll. But the Ark was a good place to play in. And Elvira ran a very nice kind of setup. And it was very kind of um, uh, innovative in its, in its approach. And of course, as soon as she made a success of it, I think, uh, CIA, you know, CIE, the uh, Corus Umperere, and who owned the place, wanted it to sort of do the same thing on Saturday night. I think she used to run the show on Friday night, or maybe it was Saturday night. They wanted to run a similar thing on Friday night when they saw how successful she was. But I don't think they could have competed with her because she had a nice touch mm -hmm. and um, managed to get as many of the local bands playing. So and organize gigs in Dublin as well. So you, you'd end up, you might play in the Ark and then the following week you'd be up playing in the Magnet in Dublin. And um, at that stage I was playing with Michael Disney and uh, Cahal and Sean had written an encore song called Come Back and Flam Me like you did last year. <laughs> Flam Me, you fucking bastards. So I just get these young Dubliners coming up to me saying, oh, Roy, come here, uh, what does come back and flam me actually mean, Roy? <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was a great uncle song, come back and flam me like you did before. Come back and flam me, you fucking bastard. <laughs> <laughs> what, what a brilliant song. Like, idea. So uh, that was the encore song. And well, that you. kind of thing did well in Dublin enough, but they once got us a gig in Trilly in Danny Lean's place. And after hearing that stuff, he fired us and asked us never to come back. To <laughs> <laughs> oh, fair um, And Limerick wasn't a bad. We played in Limerick as well, and they got the humor right. in Limerick City. There was always this humor thing between Cork and Limerick, the, this kind of edgy, dark humor where people just enjoyed the... Uh, they knew you were slagging, but they loved the slagging. Yeah. But right. in, in, in Tralee, they knew we were slagging, but they, it, it, it didn't work with them at, at all. They took it more as a sort of an insult or something. Right. Just kind of, come back and flam me, flam me, like you did before. That, <laughs> in Tralee, that was kind of like, what the fuck, you're, you're having a go at us. But right. In Limerick, they went, oh, these guys are taking the piss, but we're enjoying this. It's interesting, isn't it? These differences that used to be around at that stage. Maybe the maybe well, all those differences are gone now. I don't know. Well, I guess there's a kind of a big rivalry between Cork and and Kerry as well. Traditionally, I guess. Yeah. Traditionally, yeah, yeah. Like they're probably saying, "Look at these fuckers from Cork coming up here," you know, like. Yeah, yeah. There's and there's the whole Gaelic uh, football tradition yeah. and hurling yeah. as well. But the hurling thing doesn't exist in Kerry, so it's kind of West Cork um, football versus Kerry, but right. both those areas are, are, are always in touch with each other anyway, and people are moving back and forth between 
traditionally between Cork and Kerry anyway. And I always felt like Tralee was a peculiar is a peculiar place because they they speak in Tralee with a Cork accent. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. it's funny. They kind of a, a, North, they a, kind of a twang. Yeah. Yeah, 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 they do, yeah. So was them yeah. expressing their higher values. Really. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, Gertie, I know you don't want to talk about it, but just for our American viewers, like... For our American viewers. Yeah, that's, please, that's uh, my excuse. For yeah. our, could you talk a little bit about uh, Finbar Donnelly and his... Oh, no, I don't, I'll talk about anything, lads, whatever you right. want. Just yeah. ask me. Yeah. Yeah, our American fans uh, were asking us about yeah. Finbar Donnelly. Uh, yeah, our hardcore American yeah. indie rock fans. We're massive in America. Yeah. <laughs> we've bro we've broken we America. America with our <laughs> podcast. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah Don Donnelly was I mean, amazing, really, in, in a sense, because um, uh, just li they've, they've just managed to re really put together a whole compilation of all this stuff under the name of um, Hiding from the Landlord. You can actually get on to one of those uh, band camp or something like that. And oh. actually you can hear the entire album or buy it and stuff like that. And it's a compilation of everything that he was involved in from the late 70s until he died in the late 80s. And the thing about him was, and it, he was definitely the best singer of his generation. Right. I'm talk not talking about traditional singing, but just having this amazing voice. Yeah, uh, and being able to use it, everybody else, inclu including Bono, were still in the process of learning how to reach any level at all. Whereas Donnelly automatically had it and could play with his voice. And another interesting thing about him was that he he could take what people were saying around him, all the little mad bits of conversation, mm -hmm. and drag them into a song. Right. And and and, and, and what Irish rock and roll, I suppose in many ways, typically and all, would be an imitation of the American version, because that's the original version. So a good yeah. Irish rock and roll band in the 70s would usually be singing about similar stuff as say, the Americans that they love to listen to anyway, because they, a lot of Irish bands were playing the blues or whatever. But Donnelly was singing about, he had, he used to just grab expressions from the street and make an entire song of it, like the Nahini Shuffle. Uh, a lot of it uses the expression, come here, what's in there? Not an okay sound. <laughs> he weaves that into the song, and then he does it in his Belfast accent, because he was originally from Belfast, but they had to leave during the beginning of the war, really, in, in the late 60s, so they moved down to Cork. And so he, he might kind of go, that's my house. He'd sing like, that's my house in there. That's my house in there. That's my <laughs> house in there. You know, he'd, he'd jump back between Cork and Belfast. It was really amazing. So he just grabbed these bits and he had such an amazing voice. Yeah. That, that he could just do it effortlessly. Or he would appear to be effortless. He, and he, he, he was into, sub sorry, go ahead. Yeah. See, he'd subvert himself then by being such a mad guy in right. the public area that people often didn't really realize it, how good he was until well later on. And maybe even now they're realizing it if for those people who listen to the recordings. Uh, right. Because you know, there's a lot of examples of him just swo swooping up to a note and hitting it perfectly in tune. And the melody might be very sophisticated. And you're kind of going, how the fuck did he do that? Like, he was like 19, and he was already ahead of everybody else. So I said to my partner one day, Barbara, I started going, it's amazing that Donnelly got very little respect, and Mick Lynch of Stump yeah. couldn't really sing at all, was taken way more seriously. And she said, ah, but Mick Lynch was middle class. Donnelly was working class. And that's a big thing, I think. I think she was right there, you know. He was a working class guy. and. So we're not just taken very seriously. And it's, it was diamonds in the rough, that's what they were like. They were mad guys, they drank too much, they were crazy, they took too many illegal drugs, they were like living rough in London. But they had these moments of brilliance, which uh, I, I think is some of the best Irish rock and roll ever recorded. Right, and 
I, I heard he was into UFOs too. Is that correct? I don't know about that. Right. I, I don't know about that. But he read all the time, mm -hmm. you know, and um, he, he, uh, he came out to my place one, one, one day uh, right. unexpectedly. And my mother said, oh, Jesus Christ, look at <laughs> <laughs> I was having dinner at the table, and my mother says, that, oh, Jesus Christ, look in. <laughs> Donnelly. <clears throat> there was Donnelly walking in uh, with my younger sister. And another day, they used to rehearse. In, we had a pig shed in the back of our place. And some, some of the lads connected to Nun Attack came out to our house one night, and my father answered the door, and there was sort of AC was one of the lads, and he said, uh, "Is this Gordy's house?" And my father said, "Yeah, yeah." Are the lads jamming and all? And my father, my mother used to make jam, you see. <laughs> <laughs> so he, my father said, "Hang on there a minute." She, he went back and he said, "Betsy, there's some boys out from the town, out from the city. They want to buy jam." They had no concept of this word jamming like right. you know, it's connected to music. My sister had to translate. Um, and I, I, we, we were actually in the shed that night. Uh, so I think it was Ricky's uncle George was coming to collect an amplifier or something. So uh, yeah, it was fun times. Yeah. I, I think uh, I re Sorry, go ahead, Gordy. No, no, away that to walk. Uh, I read maybe it might have been the interview with Don or some other interview where you were talking about rehearsals and like like some bands would rehearse and some bands wouldn't kind of thing. And oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, my, my, uh, by, by, I'd, by about March of my first few months with them, I joined up with them in September. I'd say by March, uh, it, it became obvious to me that that even I was too middle class for these fuckers, like, because uh, whether or not they turn up for a rehearsal was fuck. I had no idea. Yeah. So uh, even though they were very talented and I really enjoyed them, I jumped ship over to Micro Disney. Uh, they right. were just coming together, and I, I remember saying to Sean O'Hagan, "If you want a guitarist, I I jump in." And <laughs> so, I mean, they they weren't as much fun as as non attacks, but. Uh, at least, I mean, they'd always turn up for a rehearsal, so. Right. Uh, right. I mean, if you're getting on, on your bike and you're cycling miles to uh, to a rehearsal, it's kind of handy if at least it goes ahead. Even if you're 19 and 20, it's a bit of a, it pisses you off because, you know, the weather in Ireland is pretty bad, so. Yeah, yeah. Just cycling right. in the rain and stuff. Um, um, Gordy, you moved to Dublin in, in 1988. Um, That's right. Uh, why? Yeah. why? Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, I mean, the the. Uh, I have to try and remember now. Why? <laughs> <laughs> I was um. I think that um, we had done everything that you could in Cork in 1988 by 88, and uh, I I was living with Roger Gregg, who was a playwright. Yeah, and he was considering the move as well for a while. So we thought, Jesus, we'll have a go at Dublin, you know. And um, it seemed to be the right move uh, at the time. I mean, I probably was around twenty-eight or twenty-nine years of age, but that's always a kind of like let's let's try somewhere else. And Cork is it's not what they tell you it is. It's it's actually a small town. Yeah. If if Ed is lying to you, Dave, about about Cork being so amazing. <laughs> no, I I I I don't say things like that. <laughs> no, I wouldn't say I don't know. But uh, um, you, if you if you listen to a lot of Cork people, you swear to hell like it was about the size of New York, but it's actually a tiny place and sure. and and it would burn you out trying to get anything done, especially when you're like young and want to do stuff. Yeah. So I guess that was probably it. And uh, and yeah. how were you uh, received in Dublin when you when you moved there as a musician? As a man. Um, as a man. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it was good, you know. It yeah. was going through, Dublin was going through a great period at the time because all the artistic crowd you know, like what I mean, all the musicians and playwrights and poets and they're all together living in the inner city 
loads of people were on the dole, but the dole was kind of weird at the time because you could sign off if you were doing gigs. Right. Are you if you'd be in the dole on a on a on a in the morning, let's say, I think maybe you'd have to sign on at least once a month anyway, and you'd be in this long queue, and then fellas from Fair City and Glen Row and <laughs> local bands that were kind of well known, and they'd be kind of signing on and signing off if they were getting work, and and flats were very cheap, and I was living in the north inner city, and I think it was around about. I was sharing a place for, for about 15 pounds, pounds a week. Mm -hmm. And then I moved into a bed set for around 20 a, a week because everything was measured in, in how, much, how much you paid a week for stuff. And I was living with the landlady below me and she was grand. And uh, so it was a kind of an eccentric kind of a place where you could have artistic notions and you could um, do gigs and wheelings or whatever and still sign on the dole and sign off if you're doing something special. And the whole thing was kind of, somehow it, the dole office was a big arts council at right. the time and it was cheap. And the Dubliners had a, f like not maybe the inner city people, but the general all around feeling of the place was, well, get on with it and we'll see what we'll make of you then. You know, it wasn't as, it wasn't as difficult to find rehearsal rooms and musicians who were kind of on for trying out stuff as Cork was, yeah. despite the fact that it, Cork was an eccentric place. It was also difficult. The gravity in Cork was much bigger than it was in Dublin, so you had to try to get something done in Cork would take far more energy. It was far easier to get things done in, in Dublin. I found anyway, and there were some lovely old dolls around the place as well that you could be lamped in. Yes. So, uh, so, um, <laughs> you, know, like, you know those kind of heterosexual things that you can't talk about on the radio. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> these days, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Lamping the old dolls. Lamping the old dolls, the glory days. Yeah, we're not allowed. <laughs> Actually, it was what? on a Dorset Street. There was a fellow from Cork. Was, I can't remember, but he was a bodyguard in a shop. Right. And he was a very fucking typically odd kind of a guy. And he found out after I was from Cork, and when I was in there one night, and he says, uh, come here, I was in uh, the meeting place there on Dorset Street last night. Unbelievable chazzy boo, man. Unbelievable <laughs> chazzy boo. And I, I fell around laughing. Do you, do, do, do you, Ed, did you ever hear anybody talking about the chazzy boo? I've heard the expression, and I, I, <laughs> I, uh, I, need, I need it to be re-explained to me and to our American viewers. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> the chazzy boo are the women, you know, chazzy yeah. boo. It's all like if he said, unbelievable chazzy boo, man. What the hell? Like the chazzy boo here is amazing, man. And you you, you haven't come across that before, Dave, no? No, not boo. chazzy boo, no. Yeah, yeah. It's a great <laughs> expression, isn't it? <laughs> Wonderful. And the thing about cock slang is that it can be used in many different ways. It's not so, like in Dublin, they don't have this. But in Cork, they could roar up on, on stage, like you're on stage, and they go, Gardy, you're a fucking lag, or boy! Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. kind of like you can also say to someone, how's it going, lag, huh? Yeah. And they could be a friend of yours, but right. you can't say to somebody, it's not as easy to say to someone, like, you're, you're fucking gobshite, because it's more aggressive. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and I noticed that here as well, that I often, um, I just don't know what to say to people. Even if they speak some form of English, like their 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 use of words like if you call someone an asshole or an arsehole here, they really mean it. You know, it's they're not kind of messing. Whereas in Cork, it's kind of like you never know for sure if somebody is slagging you or if they're taking the piss or if they're your friend. If they're kind of going, "How's it going? You fucking steamer!" Right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Because these these words are kind of they're they're never fully totally negative and never fully totally positive right they're they're interchangeable yeah 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 it's so it's like very say again no no it's i i guess it's like the word cunt as yeah. well yeah oh god that's a hardcore word but i it is but i mean like to nothing back back in yeah. ireland it, it can be even a term of endearment, endearment you know yeah. i know yeah yeah, yeah 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 in ireland in ireland 
this is a problem I have because you can sort of say, say about like, where's that fucking shower cunts anyway? They're late. <laughs> yeah. And it doesn't mean anything. Yeah. Whereas in the big bad world, the word cunt is a very hardcore word. It is. Yeah. Or like, if if somebody falls off their bicycle and, you know, hurts their leg, you can say, oh, the poor cunt. Like, yeah, you know? yeah, yeah, yeah. Or if some fella robs a bank, you can say, oh, he's some cunt. <laughs> I know, yeah, yeah. And, and at the same time, you don't even mean that anything too bad about him. You're no. actually praising him. Yeah, this exactly. It must be a huge problem for you in America because the Americans, my understanding of them is that they take things incredibly literally. Maybe oh, not they do. Yeah, they can do. Yeah, yeah. well, the, the C word, as it's called here, is, is, is hardcore, yeah. But aren't so. the Americans the maddest fuckers ever? They, they're really uptight about words, right? Big yeah. words. And yeah, yet they'll drop the biggest bombs and kill the most people with their biggest, hugest bombs ever. Yes, and we're going to get to that soon. And the police will kick the shit out of everybody, even if yeah. they're protesting, and they'll destroy the lives of so many black people and all this kind of stuff. But you can't say to a policeman like he's an awful fucking cunt. That guy. <laughs> <laughs> they'll beep the word. Yeah. And they'll be kind of going, oh, God, that's terrible what you just said. How dare you use that word? Fuck the word. Like, the guy's a fucking spadgy prick. Like, how could he do that? Yeah. Like, scumbags, like, gobshites, fucking toll mm -hmm. rags. And you have to use Irish words because if you use the words that they know, they'll, they'll focus in on the use of the word rather than, um, like, if some muck savage called the back black person a nigger, right? They'll yeah. pretend that that word was never said and call it the N word, whereas in fact you have to use the word to show how much of a prick the guy who uses the word. Do you understand yeah. what I mean? Yes. That's yes. my view on it. Because the word's a scummy word, but the guy who's using it is a much bigger scumbag than the word. Right, absolutely. You know? agree and, with that. And I hate I, being treated not as an adult when I hear American shows and they're beeping out words like, like, like fuck and all this kind of stuff like which is a great word yeah mm -hmm. and for sure we're uptight about that yeah you know, oh it's true but, uh, but, but back to uh back to the to dublin and music crack in the 80s um and 90s uh just like wondering uh were you always all like i mean i feel like i know the answer to this question but i'm going to ask it anyway like was it always you know, were you always all about the music or was there ever a desire to like, uh, as we say in America, like really make it, like hit the big time and make thousands and thousands and millions of dollars? Did, did, did those thoughts never cross your mind, Gertie? Were you always a pure artist? <laughs> <laughs> that was a great question. Yes. <laughs> in this case, you can replace the word artist with langer. Okay, were you always a pure langer? So. <laughs> Fantastic, yeah. Um, um, because, like, you know, when when you said about the reason I asked that, I suppose, is because, you know, when you moved on from uh, the lads at Non Attacks to Micro Disney, like, was it like, oh, they're more professional, like, we're going to hit the big time kind of thing? Was there any that kind of feeling, like? You know I, I can't mean? remember too well, but it was very uncomfortable wor wor working with Non Attacks when they'd never turn up and. I, I think I just wanted to kind of settle in with a bunch of people that would turn up and um, but I was very young so I discovered that I was uncomfortable with um, sort of any type of tiny local celebrity when it actually landed on me I felt like a little bit like oh I don't like that too much Right. Um, and I guess I was pushed towards, I was mostly interested in, in seeing what would happen with the music. But sometimes you had to think about the other stuff if you were trying to keep um, a band together because you'd need to be able to make the next move because you're trying to pay for a rehearsal room or all that kind of stuff. I remember having that problem with Nine Wazis was how to keep this together and keep everybody happy because the bass player was amazing. Like. Uh, Eddie Lee was from Sligo, played right. with those nervous animals, but he was a session bass player. And um, he was just about one of the best bass players around, but to keep him um, turning up for rehearsals and going for gigs, you had to kind of uh, also remember that he was going to be playing the bass with Dolores Keane next week. Right. And um, 
So he, he was always under pressure to turn up for the money gig. Right. You know, he would like to do the other. So you, you'd kind of like, God, I'm going to try and get good gigs so that Eddie would make some money for this because he's a professional bass player. Right. It was different for the drummer Peter because Peter was kind of a, he was into running nightclubs and restaurants as well. So he was independently somehow wealthy, but Eddie was uh, making his living from playing the bass. And I think he liked the Wazis because he was a huge fan of Frank Zappa and he liked anything that was experimental and anything that was out there, he liked it. Captain Beefheart, all that kind of stuff. But mm -hmm. making a living, he had to play with Dolores Keen and and because uh, he was, you know, he was getting married soon and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So I understood why eventually he moved up to Sligo again uh, to start that process of uh, marriage life and having kids and settling down to a degree. Um, but for a period when he was playing with the Wazis, he was he was an absolute amazing bass player. So uh, so that's it's all it's always a sort of like a trade off. You you want yeah. to do the best music possible uh, but sometimes you have to think about uh, how you keep this together if you're not Frank Zappa and you're not a millionaire and you can't pay for everybody to turn up so you have to try and always pick your battles or something yeah so, yeah, yeah indeed and, and uh, with, could you explain to our American audience how you came up with the, the name uh, Nine Wazis from Banya for this band oh yeah yeah it was one of those Cork events I was in I was in um, the Long Valley Right. And there was a guy from Waterford who had a great sense of humor, and his name was Paul, and he was a visual artist, very gifted guy, and a very funny guy. We are talking about Captain Beefheart. He made some odd comment, like, uh, do you know that there's um, nine lovely lassies down there in fucking Bandon, like, you know? And this mad conversation struck up. And then afterwards, I was walking down, uh, is it Winthrop Street? That's yep. On the, the Long Valley, walking down the street, heading home or something. And uh, I said, God, nine wassies, nine lassies from Bandon. That'd be a mad name for a band. Nine, nine lassies from Banya. Fuck. <laughs> yeah. And then went, Fuck, nine wassies from Banya. Oh, wow, that's a mad name for a band. And uh, yeah. ever after that, then it was kind of difficult to get. The, the whole thing, you know, like, well, what's the band called? Nine was this from Banya, and people go, what the fuck? And one of the funniest things that happened, there was a, I was walking down the street, and we had just played, and the posters weren't down yet, and there was posters around Dublin, and we had played in Whelan's, and, and the, there was a poster on Dame Street. And I was walking down the street, and I met a very young, blonde, me Huffig. Oh, yeah. she, she's from Rakar and Gwerthoch, and she had just started a working on RTA and I met her on the television program. She's well known, I think, nowadays. Yeah. And she was a fine young thing and she um, she said to me, uh yog, don't tell him shin tashit shin nine wasis from Banya. That's a stupid name. Like, look at that. <laughs> and she didn't know that I had anything to do do with it. Uh, so I played it on. <laughs> what and she was like trying to figure out what the fuck's a wazi and nine wazis from Banya. Jesus, that's a stupid name. I remember her <laughs> saying that to me. I thought it was a good comment. Um, and then someone, I think Peter, the, the drummer, he wanted me just to make it nine wazis. But I was a big fan of, you know, Brian O'Neill and all that, you know, like Miles Nagopoulin and yeah. all that kind of stuff. And for me, it made perfect sense. And sure. if you put it into German, it's fantastic. Yeah. It's, it's uh, Nine Vespers von Milch. Nine, nine Vespers <laughs> von Milch. Nine, nine Vespin von Milch. Wow. Right. Which is even more ridiculous. Then they're going, what? Nine Vespers? And they're going, nine, nine Vespin von Milch? <laughs> <laughs> and nine Wazis from Banya, um, you guys played for the prisoners in uh, oh, Mount. In Mount Joy. Oh, how was that? Right, yeah. um, um, you, did you guys emulate Johnny Cash? <laughs> oh yeah, well, they loved us. Yeah. Except they would have stabbed us quicker than loving us. I'd say. Uh, <laughs> yeah, they they all left. It right. wasn't a great gig anyway. I must say uh, the sound was terrible. And um, but uh, 
you had to make the best of it, but but it wasn't one of the best performances. But even if we did one of the best performances, I'd say the fucking racket we were doing was not to their liking. I, I didn't get the impression that they uh, that they would have liked it anyway. Yeah. And how did that come about, Gertie? Uh, you guys. Not, I, was, I was living with a man called Arthur Leila, and Roger Gregg used to refer to us as the two Oscars. Right. Because we were disaster cases. But his father was Colm O'Leary, um, who, uh, who had worked with Gaeling as, as a, uh, making films, those early Irish films. And Art was teaching in Mountjoy, film work. And he decided to kind of mount a gig in there and asked me, would we play in there? And he, that's why he filmed the gig, because he was, had some of the prisoners filming it. Sure as well so they were all training uh, under him so that was the work he was doing because he was in that area of making films and stuff like that and documentaries so um, uh, but I wasn't living with him when we did the gig I had been living with him in the early 90s and then he contacted me and said would was his play in Montjoy uh, I said yeah that sounds great and I think there was money for it and stuff but I, I played since in Berlin as well in the in the Frauen Geheimnis in um, a, a woman's prison here in Berlin, which was I, a fascinating um, thing because the way the Germans treat their prisoners is very well, and we we actually ended up getting a tour of the prison and the prison guard was showing us not that I understood everything but where people lived were far. They treat prisoners very well here, actually. Oh. Not the scummy way that they treated it in your new land or in Ireland, probably as well. Right. Yeah. So, sure. um, and the audience were far more interested in this German thing. I mean, I wasn't playing my own music or anything. I was just playing right. in this German band for a little bit. And mm -hmm. um, so I played prisons twice in my life. Fair play. It's her time. I'll be on the other side. <laughs> <laughs> so tell tell us a bit about like why you moved to Berlin in the first place. Have, did you just have enough of Ireland or what? Like yeah, I had enough. I'd say because uh, Dublin was great, but uh, when I moved back to Cork, that was a difficult time, you know. Right. And um, and then it 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 sort of it moved like this then for a while. But I reckoned that I wasn't in a safe place because I was I was teaching guitar in North Cork and I used to travel up there by Honda 90 on the Tuesdays right. uh, and stay with my sister and the work was nice because I enjoyed teaching children that was excellent but uh, driving up on a Honda 90 on the Tuesdays was definitely somebody was going to get me not necessarily because they wanted to get me but a dog might run out or a tractor right. might come on because I was traveling the country roads up up to North Cork, so I decided to, I had a choice, three, I had a choice of three B's, right? Balavorna, Priyav Kaharach, Magaeltachta, Balakriya, Priyav Kahar, Naheren, Berlin, Priyav Kahar, Magarmine. Right. It's a fuck me, Berlin. Do you see it? Yes. I was thinking, when I go to Balavorna, when I, when I go back to Dublin, or should I go to Berlin? And we were discussing, myself and Barbara were discussing this for a, for a good while before we decided on Berlin. And, so. and like, there, there's a lot of, there was a lot of talk around Berlin. I remember when I was a younger man saying, oh, it's mad cheap to live over there. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, that, it was, really, yeah, it, it was for a long time very cheap. And it probably right. still is compared to Ireland. Right. Um, uh, there is an influx, of course, of cute whores trying to buy up property. And the Germans, though, are quite good at fighting this fighting back. They're quite amazing, you know. Like Barbara was working in a, in a, in a bakery, um, and an English man called Charles Skinner had bought the entire building. <laughs> and he... Um, his Great name, was, he's... A perfect man name for uh, this Anglo guy coming in. At, uh, so he, buy, he buys this big house on Reichenbergerstrasse, and in the in uh, part of the house to the left, twenty years, is a bakery. 
And the trick here is to, to fix up the building and then kick everybody out and bring, and bring back a new, a new type of individual. So he decides, anyway, I'm going to kick everybody out and I'll, I'll throw the bakery out. But it's the only bakery on Reichenbergerstrat. And people go to, to it every morning for their bread and coffee before they go to work. So the people started getting annoyed that this fucking English guy comes in, right? And he, just, he decides to turn it, the whole building into, a, into sort of a tourist building, wants to start a restaurant and kicks out the bakery. And they have an expression, chicky Mickey, meaning that, that's is their chicky Mickey, meaning that's very uh, it's posh, you know, chicky Mickey is chicky their Mickey. word for posh. It's a great yeah. word. Yeah. And uh, so anyways, um, they start protesting and every Saturday they protest on the street. And then the local fucking punks from uh, got in, the, uh, in on the game and they started spray painting his restaurant. And then they started smashing the windows of his restaurant. Right. And, and then it, the whole thing blew up and it became a media thing. And then the German, uh, the Berlin government got involved and the Reichstag and everything. And uh, eventually um, he, he relented and offered the bakery a chance to stay on the street wow. and gave them a deal. And, and, and since he decided to sell the building and he wanted to sell it for an amazing profit and the Germans wouldn't allow it. And I think he bought it for for four million, let's say, euro or something. And he wanted to sell the building for eleven, and they wouldn't allow him to sell it for anything more than around seven. And he was going mad. So the Germans are sort of fighting back, and there were huge pro protests against Google moving into into in, also into um, Kreuzberg lately. And and that. Google decided that they couldn't move in there. They just weren't allowed because there was huge protests on the street. So the Germans are fighting back a, 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 a bit against this globalization and this thing that, you know, which probably happens in New York and Dublin and everything. Is um, the artists come first and then big business comes in and then nobody can live in the place anymore. Right, right. Could, could, you, could you talk to us a bit more about the art scene in Berlin? like? Is it as romantic as uh, the seventies with Bowie and Iggy Pop and all that? I think that's all kind of an, an illusion. Yeah, it's yeah. really like Berlin is really the Galway of of um, of, of of Deutschland. Right. It's the fun club place, and it's a hedonistic town. The amazing thing about it is that it's quite safe. So let's say you can walk around any day or night. And you're going, nobody's going to hassle you. The Germans are amazing in, in that they're very um, practical about what's on the street. Mm -hmm. So they'll never destroy something if they can steal it. Oh. Mm -hmm. If they can't steal it, they'll leave it alone until they can steal it. <laughs> <laughs> the Irish will destroy something. Oh, look at this nice bike. They will kick the shit out of that. <laughs> Germans think that's a bit weird. Why would you... Uh, why would you destroy something if you could actually steal it and sell it, you see? Yeah. So you can leave anything on the street once it's locked. And they leave things out on the street if they want you to take it. Mm -hmm. So if you have an amplifier or something you don't want, you put it out on the street and it'll be gone in about 10 minutes. Right. Um, uh, but So it's an amazing system like that. So it's a kind of a, an interesting, safe place but as an artistic capital, I don't know if it's really what people actually think it is. Uh, it's kind of lax and hedonistic and they love their restaurants and they love going to bars and they'll stay in bars for hours. But they'll never come out of the bar locked and kicking the shit out of each other. That's That never happens. Right. <laughs> so um, you don't feel you're in a hot thriving kind of crazy artistic place right. you're, you're in a kind of a nice retirement home okay feeling about it would you it's say nice. it, yeah could, could it be described as feminized um well it's certainly a good place if you're a woman in the sense of um you're safe right 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 you can walk through any park at any time of the day or night, and it's unlikely that anybody will ever hassle you. Yeah. 
And it's a good place for children. There's everything called the Kita system, which is quite amazing. They'll, they send children to school at six months old. Wow. So a mother can kind of dump their, the child into a safe environment uh, starting at six or eight months of age, and the child gets socialized, and the parents can go back working or doing whatever they want. So there's loads of Kitas around the place. And, yeah. it's, and then after you're in Kita, you go to national school then. Uh, and uh, in the Kita, you start around half nine in the morning. In the national school, you start uh, at around eight in the morning. So it's a different type of thing. So um, from that point of view, it's uh, if it's a feminized city, I'm not sure, but... Um, yeah, that was I was just being provocative. <laughs> oh no no. Oh no way. Trying to get the rise of you. <laughs> Fishing for if you're, a, if you're a dirty, one line. If you're a dirty if you're a dirty knobber like me, <laughs> it's not a safe place to be cycling your bike. Right. Do do you feel like they appre is your work appreciated over there, like? Well by by a very small amount of people, maybe what happens is, I mean, first of all, anyway, it's a typical European city, so there's millions of different types of people, like where I live now, there's loads of Brazilians. Cool. Um, and there's Italians. I, I meet lots of Italians. Right. And they, they, they wouldn't have any interest at all in what I might be doing or any of that kind of stuff. Right. They don't really notice you if you're not Italian. Okay. Um, the Germans, Barbara, for instance, I think was asked by her piano teacher and her boss, what does your man do? And she eventually gave a copy of the Wazi CD to them and they reported back good things because I didn't get in their way because they didn't know me, you know, that kind of way. Yeah, right. Um, right. I'm um, not... I'm not I'm not too pushed about kind of spreading my aura out anyway. I, it doesn't Perfect. because I managed to live away here. I have a little kind of a home studio that I'd be working away in, and right. that's probably the thing that I like the most. T tell us, tell us more about that. Like, tell us more about the kind of music you're making these days. Uh, um, yeah, it's a, it's the usual uphill battle that's connected to the home studio setup. Is when you're working on. Um, in a, in a setup that provides you with too many options, but mm -hmm. you're still only yourself, so you lack you lack objectivity. So like, uh, right. I'm what I I might work on a piece of music, but I have no idea if number one if it's any good, and number two is the mix any good, or does it sound any good? Because you're sort of working on your own, so. Uh, there, like there was a competition there lately uh, um, for um, doing a soundtrack to a bit of a television program called Westworld that I'd never heard of. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, and I and I set about doing a soundtrack for the four minutes, and I did this little soundtrack for it. And then I had to put it up on on YouTube, uh, and then I sent the link to the people who were going to judge it. And the last time I listened to it, I was going to going, fuck, is it any good or is it shit? I have no idea because I can't tell. Because uh, you're, when you're working at something, you compose something and then you mix it. You have no objectivity at all by the time you're finished with it. And uh, the old business of when you were working in studios long ago and you were in with engineers and stuff and the engineers were going, oh, the bass is a bit loud. You were getting lots of, and you were working with other musicians. So the advantages are there, but the disadvantages are, are also there. You're going, fuck, this sounds good to me, but maybe it just sounds good to me. Maybe it's a piece of shit, like, I have no idea. So it's it's that usual battle, but it's kind of fun, really, in its own way. I mean, yeah. it's better than a lot of it, so. Uh, and would it be fair to say that a lot of your inspiration comes from uh, your imagination or... or elsewhere you seem I like guess it's, no. i guess it's imagine musical imagination really i, I guess yeah. um i guess yeah i mean uh, 
I mean, it's, it's very, it depends on the context. <laughs> Uh, yeah. I had a fun time once in Cork. Um, there was a bunch of fellas around the place who were involved in, in sound art. And they were doing a, a performance in a St. Fenbar's. Right. And um, I had recorded my nieces when they were very young. And I got, I took them to a local kind of a burger land as a treat if they did this for me. <laughs> And I got them to say all these horrible cock things, right? I mean, unbelievable fucking things. Uh, right. And they didn't know what they were saying because they were like eight and nine years of age. Wow. <laughs> and I, I kind of, I, 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 I told one of them to say this thing and the other to say the other thing. And then I put them together. It sounded like they were, too, they were just saying these things to each other. And one of the conversation was about this fella. And I had heard it in the pub in Cork about... Did you hear about Oni at all? No, he was uh, he was working in the bay. This guy was working on a uh, on a trawler. You know what I mean? He got fired. Oh, oh really? Yeah, yeah. He got kicked off. He got caught playing the tuna fish. <laughs> smell his lang on. There's a smell of tuna fish off it. Fucking Joffrey Noble, right? So that'd be brilliant. So I got them to say that. So I made this kind of sound art comp composition anyway, using the voices of my nieces. And um, uh, it was kind of comical because as the staff who were working in St. Finbar's realized what they were hearing, <laughs> at first it sounded like the same shite that everybody else was doing. You know, all this noises and drones and bollocksology. <laughs> the next, next thing, one of my nieces kind of comes in with, did you hear about Oni at all? <laughs> <laughs> and then like more bollocksology. And then another voice goes, no, what happened? <laughs> he, and then another voice goes, he got caught playing a tuna fish. <laughs> and then the staff fly were going, what the fuck? Yeah. And then this goes, the other voice goes, the fucking lang arm. <laughs> and another voice goes, yeah, if you... If you smell these langer, there's a smell of tuna fish. <laughs> <laughs> and you could see the staff kind of going, fucking hell. Yeah. The staff who were working in there were working separately to the Sound Art Festival. And the staff were there to bring in the tourists. And the Sound Art Festival was going on at the same time. So the staff were kind of going, what the fuck is this like? And these were like the sounds of nine-year-old girls. So... That was kind of a bit of fun, I must say. Um, but usually in Germany, I don't have the same options. <laughs> right. And, uh, and, uh, and then a bunch of years ago, I don't know if you saw this or not. I don't want to be shining on too much about myself. I uh, made this enormously good fun film called May Fame. Did you ever hear Yeah, that? We, yes. watched, we watched that, yeah. It's Classic. It's like your, it's, it's 2004. Insane. Yeah. Huh? 2004. 2004? Yeah, yeah. yeah we, watched, similar, we watched it last night. Masterpiece. Yeah. It's in a similar uh, uh, sort of spirit as your play, Ed. You know, the, was it the unbelievably sad life of... The, uh, the self-obsessed tragedy of Ed Malone, yeah. Ed Malone, yeah. It was in that same kind of spirit, you know? Yeah, for sure. I don't know about your play, but people took the film kind of almost for real or something because there was yeah. no hint there was no hint in the entire film that this was actually a complete piss take yes yeah, which is brilliant well it, it was very well made as well yeah. whoever shot it did a great job yeah, yeah it was this guy uh, Colm Tobin I couldn't speak higher of him he, yeah. he, um, right. he went on to work on Langerland and all these oh right and, right and uh, he um there was a, there was, and the film had its own in, eternal soap opera as well because I had a, I at first I asked this fella called Mike Daly. Mike Daly, Mike yeah. Daly, yeah. I asked Mike Daly, would he do the, um, the film for me? And what basically happened is that Mike kept telling me he'd do it, but would never turn up. <laughs> And eventually, I got really angry and, and had this argument on the phone with him, which caused him then to go into the soap opera mode. And then, went, and then I went to Dublin now for something, and I was talking to Dermot Furlong in Trinity College. Right. 
who said to me, why don't you ask Colin Tobin? He's really good. And Colin said, I'd, I'll do it, but I have to direct it. And I said, perfect. So when, 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 when Colin interviewed Mike Daly, Mike Daly is really annoyed with me, actually annoyed with me. He actually fucking hated me as a result of this little soap opera, which happened by accident. Because the whole film is a, is a, is a scam, right? Yeah. But the bit with Mike Daly is actually real. That's amazing. Yeah. Isn't, yeah. That, isn't that amazing? And like, um, and it was an ex-girlfriend of mine who kind of went, who's the guy who really doesn't like you? And I said, which one is that? There was a fellow with a beard and he, I, his body language, I, I think he fucking hates you. And I said, yeah, yeah, he, he fucking hated me. <laughs> wasn't, that the maddest, wasn't it the maddest thing ever that there was actually a real soap opera happening as well at the same time? It wasn't all acting. Yeah, well, the the opening shot of Mayfane was was fantastic. Um, uh, you cycling up that hill on your bicycle. It was Sergio Leone. It was, it was like. No, it's not the maddest. It was not the maddest thing. And I'll tell you yeah. about that. That street, right, Evergreen Street, yeah. could have been called Ever Traffic Street at the time. You see, because yeah. there was two lanes of traffic allowed on the street plus parking, so there was no room for the houses. Right. Yeah. Houses were there only because the cars couldn't knock them down. So um, what usually happened on the street was that the traffic got backed up uh, all over the fucking place all the time, and there were fights on the street. So when I cycled up the street that time, I said, I'm wasting my time because I'll get to the top of the street and there'll be traffic. But nothing came. Yeah. Right. And there was no, there was no reason for it unless the traffic got backed up somewhere down the street and nobody could move or something. So there was no traffic. So I had every chance to kind of kind of go, oh, disbelieve, you know, and all this kind of stuff, which was totally improvised. Yeah. So the entire filming of it, you can hear the cycling, you can hear me coming slowly up the hill. And the whole thing just happened. And there was no disruption from the traffic. And I was signing on the dole the last time that week and yeah. it was also a sound art festival that, that I was involved in in UCC and there was the soap opera and then meeting AC on the street and having this surreal conversation that was all improvised wow yeah. and uh, and so that kind of thing made Cork kind of fun but mostly it was getting more and more like more difficult to, to stay with it which I should be talking to you about yourselves. No, no, no not I, at all. Do you no, have a question no? Cork again, or I, I have a more general question? Ask the more general question. Okay, so you spoke, um, Gerdy, you spoke earlier about how Cork had changed from, let's say, the, I think it was the 70s to the 90s, like how... Or the, oh, the 70s to the 2000s. To the 2000s, yeah. How has it changed now, do you think, from the 2000s to the, I guess we're in the 20s now? Um, yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And like, question. you're living in... You're living in Germany now, you're living in Berlin, so I guess you're part of the Irish diaspora. But like, okay. you're, looking from, you're looking at Ireland from the outside in now. How do you view it now? Like, well, how it's changed? I got, one thing is that I got, I got a letter from the German Dole office late, 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 lately. Right. Arbeit, Arbeit, um, because of the COVID thing, um, mm. I was kind of pulled out of the closet because myself and Barbara, we got married in February in Cork. Congratulations. With Mila Margaret. <laughs> and um, we, she, because of, she was working and then she's, she's a visual artist and she was teaching in one place and having this mini job in, in, the, in the bakery as well, two days a week. The, the German government immediately sent out money to everyone so everybody could live. It happened like overnight. Right. You, and, and then you're allowed to also the dole relaxed itself so that you could sign on and then they'd deal with your issues later on. And I got a letter from the dole office for the first time in my life with my name correctly spelled with all the Sheena Fada and everything. It was amazing, right? It was like, because oh. my full name is on the passport. It's Garo Junbara Olera. And it's got a bunch of Sheena Fada's, no apostrophe in that. And uh, if I, if I, um, 
So you, you, you have to sell your password and they'll send you back your name exactly the way you spell, spelled it, blah, blah, blah. And she also wants to put me on her insurance here, right? Right. And I've been trying to get onto the insurance company or not, or onto the Irish social scene, you know, the government and all that kind of stuff for a bunch of weeks, sending emails and having to ring up people and getting emails from people with my name spelled all sorts of fucking versions of it, but never right. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to say to them, look, you're going to be dealing with the Germans. They, they have my name and they want to know why are why is the name that you're giving them different? Because they don't um, they don't know they don't care what my name is, but they'll want to see. Okay, they want to see it exactly written on my passport as it comes from the Irish government, and we I can't get any any, any satisfaction out of anyone. Hmm. And it's not just my name. I just can't get them to send a letter to the to the insurance company here in Germany to say that I was entitled to this social insurance up to this date. And it's, it's a, the bureaucracy is a total mess. So Ireland does its thing forever and ever, and the Germans do their thing, but they're not compatible. Right. And the German dole office told Barbara that the two worst countries to deal with in Europe are Ireland and, and France. Oh. Because the Germans are very bureaucratical, but they sort of know how to do stuff like that. Right. You know, like they when the COVID thing hit, you filled out these forms, you send in your details, and two days later they give you five thousand euro into your bank, no right. questions asked. And uh, they're very efficient, mm -hmm. so they're looking at these Irish people and saying, "Why is the name on you're writing down different from the name on the passport? Which is the correct name?" It's like, oh, no, I. It's bad enough dealing with German bureaucracy, but I'll have to try and explain how fucked up the Irish are when it comes to this kind of stuff. And uh, right. you, you, so that's one of the sides to Ireland that I don't that I that I'm not looking forward to dealing with because you still haven't managed to get any information from them. You just keep sending me to different branches. Oh, you should be talking to this other person, ring this right. number, and then they're going, but you shouldn't be talking to me at all. You should be sending an email to this other woman. It's like, oh, God. So that's one side of it. Mm -hmm. And when we went back to Cork in February, it was like walking around a new city that I, where I knew nobody. It was kind of nice, actually. Uh, I think I saw nobody that I kind of vaguely, even vaguely knew. It was like a whole new generation. Mm -hmm. And in that sense, it was very pleasant. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, so that, that's the social side of it when I was there in February. Right. And, um, and dealing with Irish bureaucracy from Germany is, is, um, is a total mess because they won't even spell your name properly. And the other thing is they'll often send me letters as well and the letters don't arrive because they refuse to write down the address properly. Because <laughs> <laughs> the Germans have a system and you have to use their system to send letters to their country. Right. And they, 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 they tend to ignore these kind of details and put the, they put the numbers in the wrong place and the postman is kind of going, oh, this, this address doesn't exist because the Germans are very bureaucratic and you have to have everything correct for the Germans and everything incorrect for the Irish. <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know if he'd find that with the, uh, with the dealing with the American bureaucracy or not, but... The German bureaucracy and the Irish bureaucracy are totally incompatible. Right, right, right. But, uh, well, like you, you brought up, uh, just to, I suppose I have one last question, really, or maybe we have a couple more. We'll see. Uh, you brought up the, uh, yeah, you brought up the, uh, you brought up the. This is like I'm being on on DJ. Brought, he's been waiting all day, <laughs> waiting all day to ask you this because you you brought up the COVID thing a couple of times and like. There's a big uh, discussion over here, like, do we take the vaccine or do we not take the vaccine? Like, yeah, yeah. like what's, you, what's your opinion? Do you, would you take a vaccine? No, no. no yeah, fair play to you. Sorry. Okay. No, <laughs> no, no, I mean, I, I, extrapolate. Listening, listening to Ro uh, Robert Kennedy Jr., Robert Ogg, or Canadian. We've, on, uh, we've listened to him. Yeah. We're familiar with him. We're familiar, yeah. 
Yeah, and listening to what he has to say about, see, the corruption in your in your new country is enormous. <laughs> so you <laughs> can't trust anything because, I mean, nothing I'm going to say is going to surprise you. Like uh, con the American Congress is not there taking care of the American people. Sure. It's big business. It's big pharma. It's the uh, the Israeli crowd. Big the the what is it called? The Pentagon. Uh, big oil. Anybody who can buy the American Congress. So Ralph Nader, I think, was talking lately about a a book from the eighties called "The Best Congress That Money Can Buy." So yeah. if 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 you're hearing stuff from the the American Congress about something, you just can't trust it. Um, so. E even even if they did come across with, with something like that, I'd still be very suspicious of it because they're going to be. I mean, I don't trust mobile phones, for instance, at all, or yeah. microwaves, because they're, they're being they're being tested on people like lab rats. Uh, Wi-Fi to me could be dangerous. Holding a, a, a mobile phone to your to your head for long is is definitely not a safe thing because nobody knows what those microwaves are doing. And then, as you, as, as you know, from Bill Binning and all those other people, um, anybody living anywhere using a mobile phone is being tracked these days. Yeah. So if, if you do have one of those, you're doing the job of the Stasi. So mm. um, you're doing the Stasi's work for them. So, of course. Uh, yeah, you have to be suspicious. You'd be crazy enough to, to, to believe. The only thing to do is, it was funny, I heard it on, on um, NPR one day on a, on a podcast. Where a man was telling me on the internet not to trust people who are talk, telling me stuff on the internet. Figure that out, because I'm listening on the internet, right? And somebody on NPR, which I don't I mean, it's <laughs> national propaganda radio. Yeah. Jesus, to be honest. Yes, it is. Uh, yes, yes. you nailed it. Yeah, and that's what that's what Max Blumenthal calls it anyway, and, yeah. and he's probably he's definitely right. If Masquerading as a, a public service. Yeah, yeah absolutely, because it's funded by corporations. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Who who wants you to believe their shtick? Yeah. And um, uh, so if you're if you're listening um, to the station like that on the internet, and somebody's kind of going, well, you you know, you have to listen to what the government is telling you. You can't be listening to people on the internet. Somebody on the internet is telling me not to be listening to someone on the internet. But you have to shop around and hear different alternative views. Yes. And there's a lot of interesting views out there. Yeah. And they abuse the term conspiracy theory. I mean, yeah. a detective is a conspiracy theorist. Right. Like if somebody shot Ed, right? Yeah. Yes. A detective. And, and if David said Ed committed suicide, yeah. but there were two bullet holes in Ed's head, the detective then would have to say, well, there's something wrong with this story about Ed committing suicide. David could sort of say, the detective is a total conspiracy theorist. Yeah. The idea is to make the detective out to be Ed a Bang. crazy guy. Yeah. But Ed has two bullet Under holes me. in his head. Yeah. Well, that's too many bullet holes for a suicide. Yeah. Normally, you, one should do. And after, if you shoot yourself in the head and you have one bullet hole, the second one won't be necessary because the first one will kill you. Yeah. Um, I suppose since we're, we're, we're on this subject, what do you think, think of... Um, President Donald Trump. Yeah. Well, he's to to quote to quote Chris Hedges. He's been vomited up by the system, and he's a handy guy to hide behind and sort of say, "Well, he's the reason why the American situation's in a mess." Right. But he's yes. he's he's only like the expression of it. He's pretty yeah. horrible guy, but he's a bit of a sort of a genius in a way. And yeah. Um, even though now the, everything kind of fucked up for him with the COVID thing, and now with the disaster of the horror of killing that black man on the street, yeah. um, and his, his what is how he has reacted to it. Yeah. Um, but if that hadn't happened, he definitely would have been reelected because he's he's a really kind of a clever guy. But he's right. just been vomited up by a very corrupt system. What what's the mood in Germany like? Sorry, sorry, Jordy. What what's 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 the mood in Germany like um, vis a vis the uh, the riots in the U.S. Like they're shocked, they're shocked with the police because yeah. the police yeah. in Germany are incredibly efficient. Yeah. Right. They don't create any soap operas. I've seen the police arrest people here, and like if you're arrested here, you're arrested, and like if you uh, if they have to if they have to pull you off your bike. 
they'll pull you off your bike and you'll be in chains in no time and they'll take care of your bike and then they'll stand you up and start talking to you. Nobody's going to shoot anybody. Yeah. They're incredibly, right. um, they're a very organized police force. And I'm, I, I've heard that there are, of course, right wing elements and some dodgy elements, but they're very disciplined. Mostly on the street. I, I saw a big fight here among African drug dealers in Goritz Park once. And the three vans arrived, but no, nobody got killed. The fight was broken up. Everybody who had to be arrested was arrested. Yeah. Hopefully they got some sort of a fair trial, but nobody was killed. Right. The yeah. police in the USA are completely, like they're a gang, right? Yeah. But Anybody and everybody should be afraid of them because their, pro their process is to get you into jail. And it's, it's some sort of a big business thing. And if you happen to be black, like it's unbelievable what's going on. So Germans, I think, generally have spoken about it, and people are completely disgusted. I'd say. Yeah. Fair play. Yeah. They're, they're they're frightened about it as well because it's it's um, they, nobody wants this to go on. And I mean, a friend from Italy said even the Italian police can be a bit dodgy, but nothing like the American police. Right. Nothing like that, you know. Mm -hmm. What, what do you think like there's hope for the future because like i uh, we i don't well yeah we'd love to hear your thoughts and what you think should be done or what can happen to change the world and to establish world peace and all that kind of crap what's gertie's perspective how can that be achieved i don't know because human nature and the fact that we we re-loop around very quickly and the mixed crowd uh, often don't bother to learn from the previous crowd and you could play Hendrix's Star Spangled Banner now and it would be just as relevant now as it was in 1969 right. because they're still killing black people on the street like they were back then yeah. and, and uh, we're, we're not very good at learning um, but definitely the system seems to be because of the corruption going to be very difficult to change because the corruption is enormous mm -hmm. yeah. it's a bit like a, some it's a bit like when um, a poison gets into a lake or something and it takes years to clean it out again or something you know i mean um, and they have they have very sophisticated systems of bringing people down as well you mean you had this great guy ralph Nader, right and then they managed to somehow make it out that that he's a guy that you just don't need to listen to when he's actually one of the most important voices in American politics, has been consistent all along. Um, this whole Bernie Sanders thing was a bit of a disaster. As he was like a kind of like, was he just kind of using all the energy for revolution and sucking it to himself so he could dissipate it? Yeah. yeah, talk more about that, about your t thoughts on Bernie Sanders. Yeah, because he's very popular amongst the hipsters over here. Like. Yeah, the middle class hipsters. Middle class hipsters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, we, we never, he never seemed to reach the working class for some reason. The people he was... Yeah, that was conscious. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, but, in, in 2016, he, he, um, it struck me as that he was very watery in, when, he, when he had to fight. Right. And he was very suddenly um, fucked up by the, by the Democratic crowd. Yes. Yeah. And then very quickly was supporting Clinton, of all people. Yeah. So I thought he was a bit of a scam artist for that reason. So I was suspicious the second time around. And I yeah. think he must be some sort of a scammer or to have something over him, or else his purpose is to dissipate the energy of our, like, a, 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 a real desire for change that a lot of people have. We agree. We agree. With, I think that's very true regarding dis dissipating the energy. Yeah. yeah. Uh, because this guy, this guy Biden, seems to be a complete gobshite. Uh, we agree. Yeah. 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 Um, which but, is a nice way of saying it. Um, and. If he can, he like they, they showed Biden talking at the at the funeral for George Floyd, and I mean 
Biden's one of those guys that helped throw in loads of black people into prison, right? Yeah. Yes. And he's part of the money machine and he's part of the industrial military complex and all that kind of stuff. So the television should be turned off if he talks because yeah. he's totally disingenuous. And uh, so I, hopefully pe people seem to fall into this trap, you know? And, yeah, uh, there seems to be a kind of... Yeah. I believe in these characters and I don't know how they get away with it because they're complete scam artists. Yeah. That's my view of it anyway. Mm -hmm. Oh, we hear you on that. Very well said. Um, any other thoughts, questions, comments? Uh, no, no. Gertie, that was amazing. Thanks for coming on, Gertie. Thanks so much. Absolutely. That was for the American audience. <laughs> Brilliant. Gertie O'Leary, ladies and gentlemen.